So the subject for today's video is what is Damascus steel really and is it worth it? And it's kind of a complicated uh, thing to talk about. So historical Damascus steel isn't the same as what we call Damascus today. Uh, historical, it was Woots steel, so that's W-O-O-T-Z. Uh, that is a kind of ore and steel that you get from places like India and then I think parts of Pakistan. Um, it was imported to the European countries via the Middle East. So whenever a European person saw this this patterned type of steel appearance, uh, they know that it has to come through Damascus, which is a specific city. So that's why it was called Damascus steel. Uh, there is a lot of hype that some of which is deserved, some of which really isn't when it comes to Damascus, and a lot of popularity. Um, one question people often ask me is, is it worth it? And the answer is, uh, visually, sure. Um, structurally, no-ish? Unless you're the one making it, then absolutely yes. Uh, so, this is going to go into the differences between what's, which is historical Damascus, and then modern Damascus, right? So, this kind of patterning that you get on the steel, um, hopefully the camera's able to pick it up nicely, really, really good stuff here. This pattern is what you could find on Woods steel without having to do pattern welding. Uh, Woods steel is probably what Ulfbert swords are made of. Uh, there is also that potential for, and I, I do think at least one of them was pattern welding rather than being Woods. But yeah. Spoiler alert, Vikings actually did do trade. Uh, they had contact with the Middle East a lot. They're not just, like, brainless raiders. So, Ulfbert swords are a very important subject we're going to get into for Damascus. But uh, the performance of Woods steel is very, very good. That's why it had such a renowned legend to it, right? And you hear stories about Damascus steel being just dramatically better than all the other kinds of steel that exist, and that something crazy like a, a sword made of Damascus can cut through any other sword unless it's another Damascus sword, right? Uh, that kind of legend permeates even in modern-day story writing. If you look at the Valerian steel or dragon steel from Game of Thrones, that's functionally supposed to be this, Damascus, right? That's what it is. Uh, it just has some extra fantasy connotations to it. Um, I'm here to tell you that no, a sword made of Damascus can't cut through other kinds of swords, unless the other sword's made of, like, wood or something, and that while it does perform very nicely, it's not a lightsaber. The amount of times you're going to hear me say that sentence, it's not a lightsaber, in, in all my videos is, is going to be pretty often. People just don't seem to understand, like, movies are not accurate describe. Uh, depictions of what swords and knives are supposed to be doing. So, wood steel, uh, the reason why woods is able to perform so nicely is probably in part because of how easy it is to work with. And if you ever hear a story about any kind, whether it's woods or pattern welded for Damascus, or any sword for that matter, cutting through another sword, it's not that this one sword is, is made of, like, super space alloy, uh, compared to the other, what's probably happening, and this is, again, not a definitive answer for every case, but what probably happens, if there is any historical basis to these kind of legends, is that in the process of making a knife or making a sword, what you can get are uh, inclusions, so that it's like if you're forging the steel, right, and you leave an air bubble or an air pocket, right, and let's say that the air pocket is right here or it's right here, wherever, that air pocket becomes a structural weak point. So if I have an air pocket exactly here, and I come into a contact with another blade, and my blade snaps in half, it'll break along that big air bubble that's on the inside, right? So you didn't really break a solid steel knife or sword in half. You broke one that already had a chunk missing in the middle. But you couldn't see it visually because it's on, or it's underneath the surface on either end. So a void like that is one possible explanation. Uh, another is... Uh, subpar forging techniques left cracks in the blade uh, what you can have is uh, it, on the surface it'll look like a very small hairline crack and if you polish it enough you don't really see it um, but as you go deeper and deeper if you grind away and just investigate that piece of metal 
it could be that the crack is significantly wider and deeper on the inside, and on the surface it looks very thin, like a strand of hair. So that's another case of the sword or knife was just made poorly, and that's why the one that was made better cut through it. It didn't cut really, it just broke it. Uh, one last explanation is... One sword was quenched too aggressively. If you quench a sword or knife too aggressively, then it takes uh, micro fractures along its structure and it becomes very brittle like uh, glass. So in the same way that glass can shatter, a knife or sword will shatter if you quench it incorrectly. Uh, you actually see failures like that happen in Forged and Fire on History Channel, which is why I really like the show. But going on to the properties of Damascus and... and modern Damascus, right? Uh, so you forge weld low carbon and high carbon steel, and you fold it and you pattern it, right? There's a couple different ways to pattern Damascus. Uh, one option is that you take, a, a, if you think of Oreos, right? It's that l alternating pattern, and then you fold it, and then you hammer it flat, and then you fold it, and then you hammer it flat. That's one way of getting a Damascus pattern. Another way is you incorporate some of that technique, but you also take a drill press and you drill holes at slightly varying degrees of depth. And you have to be careful using that. Uh, the one I'm talking about right now is Raindrop Damascus. Uh, one of the problems you can get with Raindrop is if you drill too deep, you're going to create um, a flaw in the blade when it's completed. So Raindrop uh, looks like the wave patterns of rain falling on the ground on the blade. That's not what this is. Um, this is using a ladder, to, or closer to a ladder technique. I don't think this is exactly ladder, um, but it's not raindrop is my point. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can get Damascus. Another one is canister Damascus. So you get a canister, you get uh, like high carbon steel ball bearings, and then you get powder of a, a low carbon steel uh, or even iron, although I'd recommend low carbon steel. And then you forge weld this canister together and fold it, and that's that's another way of getting Damascus. And which one is better? Ultimately, it's, it's on what materials you're using and how comfortable you are as a bladesmith in making something out of Damascus. Now, is it worth it? So, if you look at modern alloys of steel, you can get precision that's down to like one thousandth of a single percent on all sorts of different materials like the carbon, uh, manganese, magnesium, aluminum, titanium, nickel, chromium. You can get all of these different things in a very precise ratio. And when you have that kind of control in the modern day, you don't need to pattern weld two kinds of steel. Uh, what made pattern welding popular is I can take a, a very low carbon kind of steel or even like plain iron uh, something that isn't super ideal for making a longsword, for example, because it's uh, just a bit too soft, right? And I can take a high carbon steel that maybe is too high, something that's great for knives, right? But if you put it in something like a longsword, it's too hard, and when you have a heavy impact against something, it'll crack and fracture, and that's bad. So I can take these two kinds of steel that aren't ideal, pattern weld them, and then I have something that's usable, something functional, something that's ultimately better than a sword made of just one or the other of those two materials. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's better than the modern precision-controlled alloys that we have today. And simultaneously, how good is Damascus is a complicated question because it depends on what kind of Damascus you're, you're doing uh, and what kind of alloys you're, you're doing. Uh, if I use a very poor quality low carbon and a poor quality high carbon, I can get a usable, somewhat functional, average-ish, I guess, knife or sword, right? It's not going to fall apart. As long as I use the correct techniques, it would work. But that doesn't make it an amazing steel. You have to contrast that to, say, a very high-quality high carbon and a high-quality low carbon and pattern welding that. The Damascus that you'll get from that will just by default be better. Uh, and then for quality, what do I mean by that? Uh, quality, you're balancing out a couple things. So one thing is how easily does the steel take an edge in the first place? Another is toughness. Uh, if I give it an edge, how nicely does it keep that edge even when it's uh, cutting? 
right? And, and then that can go into more specific detail. Is it better at retaining its sharpness with hard chopping into something like wood? Or uh, on the other hand, is it able to remain sharp even when I'm slicing meat all the time, right? Um, for the purposes of anyone who is in the modern day, a, a pattern weld of average quality is really all you need. You're probably not going to be sword fighting, right? But if you do compete in armored combat sports like I do, uh, a pattern welded sword, a Damascus steel, if you want to call it that, fine. Um, while its performance isn't necessarily going to be better than a mono steel, uh, visually it just looks beautiful, absolutely phenomenal. It, it can't be compared to just plain steel in its appearance. Uh, which is the next thing I'm going to get into how. When people sharpen a Damascus steel, like a pattern welded steel, and the pattern goes away, they are given the impression that this is a fake Damascus, right? That this is some kind of printed pattern that is printed on the steel and it's not really forge welding or pattern welding. And I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. So the way that you can tell, right, so this is sharpened and the pattern is gone on the sharpened portion, but... If I dipped that sharpened portion in acid, the same type of acid that created the pattern in the first place, then the edge would retain the exact same pattern as the flats on this blade or, or the spine on this blade. Um, and that's just really the only reliable way to know is this Damascus steel. O other than like if you have like microscopes, like very fine microscopes to study the, the precise pattern forming here. That's another way to tell you that it is just a printed pattern or is it actually forge welded, but most people don't own like multi-thousand dollar microscopes. So yeah, getting some kind of acid, um, I don't recommend lemon juice, don't, don't, please don't use something ridiculous like lemon juice or vinegar, um, you're gonna have a bad time ruining your blade, don't do that. But yeah, the kind of acid that, that you would want for this this uh, pattern reveal is what you would want to do on the edge if you want to retain that pattern. Uh, personally, I don't mind too much that the pattern goes away when it's sharpened, uh, but it's ultimately up to you as a consumer. Uh, now, another thing I'm going to get into is this specific knife. What is this? And that's weird to answer. So you can tell by the hilt that this has got a Viking kind of theme to it, right? Um, but it's not quite a sax. So the profile on the tip, right, that's not a clip point because it's mostly straight. A clip point, like a bowie knife, kind of curves in on itself and then goes out. Uh, simultaneously, though, it's a bit awkward to call this a sax because the belly, where the edge is, it does curl up. It's not perfectly straight. And because it doesn't go perfectly straight, um, as you can see when I lift the blade, one of the performance things that's pretty neat, I guess, is the tip is closer to the center line of the, the mass of the weapon. And when the tip is closer to the center line, it's better at stabbing. So that's pretty neat. Um, but if you're trying to get something historical, that does deviate somewhat from a historical design for a sax. Uh, another gripe I'm going to get into about saxes and Vikings in general um, I'm going to get into in another video, but hopefully you learned a lot about Damascus and if you have any questions just shoot them down in the comments and I'll see if I can answer them